Good evening, residents of Everett, Washington. I'd like to call to order the Everett City Council meeting of March 22nd, 2023. The City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Public Meetings Act. Community members are welcome to join either in person, remote via Zoom, or by calling in. For those who wish to participate in the future via Zoom, you'll find instructions to register for public comment on the City of Everett website under the City Council Department. Please note, we do not allow comments on any kind of campaigning, whether for or against ballot measures or candidates running for office. We also do not accept comments focused on personal matters that are unrelated to city business. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Mayor Franklin. Here. Council Member Zarlingo. Here. Council Member Ryan. Here. Vice President Tui. Excused. Council Member Fossey. Here. Council Member Schwab. Uh, Council Member Schwab is attending the Snohomish County tomorrow meeting tonight in lieu of council, so he's excused. Council Member Vogley. Here. President Stonecipher. Here. And Council Member Ryan, would you please lead us in the flag salute? Yes, please stand if you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Council Member Vogley, would you like to read the land acknowledgement this evening? Yes, I would. The City Council wishes to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the Shehoksh people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Thank you. And do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of March 15th? Councilmember Ryan moves approval of the minutes of March 15th. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council members Arlingo? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher. Yes. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Council President, Council Members. I have uh, quite a number of comments tonight, starting with a few updates on and a board appointment and ending with an explanation of our uh, SMART, our Sonomish County Multiple Agency Response Team. Um, so I'll apologize in advance for the long-winded comments. Uh, to start, I just want to share that last week, um, for the second time, I was invited to participate in Yale University Mayor's College and CEO Caucus. Uh, this is a program that's invitation only and it's fully funded by Yale University. The Mayor's College session included 28 mayors from across the country, as well as six retired mayors and a couple of international mayors from Poland and Ukraine. And we were joined by high-ranking officials from the White House, uh, former U.S. congressmen, and a handful of professors and CEOs. And we just talked kind of about how national policies impact local municipal agendas. And so it was very interesting uh, with a focus on public safety and economic growth. I was part of a panel on tensions around public safety and was able to discuss candidly with my fellow mayors uh, uh, from across the country what Everett's experiencing and what they're experiencing and what we can together do to make our cities safer. The second day was a CEO caucus, which brought together business leaders, scholars, as well as political leaders, diplomats, including the ambassador to Australia, the ambassador of Ukraine, uh, uh, secretary to the uh, Department of the State, and um, Senators Blumenthal and Graham were, gave keynote speeches uh, talking about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and also what all the local municipalities are doing to support Ukraine. And, um, you know, just it was a really incredible experience. This is my second time getting to participate in this. And a uh, real highlight was meeting the deputy mayor of Kiev and, and hearing directly from him. He, I got to sit next to him in uh, one of the sessions and um, really just connecting with other mayors from around the country. So. Look forward to bringing that learning back to our community. Uh, second, I wanted to announce that it's the first Pride block party um, that we've been able to host downtown, um, and it's gonna happen on June 17th. The city's partnering uh, on this, and we're, uh, the organization um, is a recipient of an LTAC grant. Um, so I'm really glad to see that, you know, none. First, that the city's been able to support it, staff have been really supportive of it, and it's great to see the LGBTQ plus events just growing in the community. I know staff have made this a priority, and I'm really happy to be a part of all the Pride events that are happening in Everett. 
And then the third, I'd like to ask for your concurrence in appointing Mackenzie Sullivan to the Planning Commission to fill position number four. And this term will expire 12-31-2028. Uh, so do I hear a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second for Planning Commission appointment. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Zerlingo? I've met Ms. Sullivan before. She's a relatively recent resident of Everett, a couple of years, but uh, has been active in the neighborhood, uh, engaged, and I'm really happy to see her participating in this. Thank you. Any other comments? I'll just add she's South Everett. We're very excited. We've, I think she's the only planning commissioner we have south of, <coughs> where is it? 526. So we're very excited to find somebody finally to serve uh, on the planning commission from that neighborhood. Very good. Gay McKenzie. Thank you. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stone Sanford? Yes. And then um, lastly, yeah, uh, so with heavy heart, I want to acknowledge that this morning, uh, today, March 22nd, at approximately 3 a.m., an Everett police officer was shot while investigating a ro robbery. The officer was transported to the hospital where he underwent emergency uh, medical treatment, including surgery. Uh, he's currently in stable condition, but I, I want to be very clear, this, his injuries were very seriously, so I ask that we all um, send him and his family our prayers for his uh, speedy recovery. Um, I know a lot of people are hurting this week. It's uh, been a really rough week for our community. And um, like all of you, I'm really sick about the gun violence that we've been seeing in our city. Uh, given the events over the last few weeks, I, it's timely that we explain the SMART team to help both our council and the community understand the rules and rules when there's an investigation into law enforcement that involves use of force incidents, resulting in serious bodily injury or death and how the communication process for, the, for that type of work goes. So the Snohomish County Multiple Agency Response Team is a team of investigators, evidence technicians, and public information officers from various law enforcement agencies and Washington State Patrol who respond to and investigate law enforcement use of force incidents resulting in serious bodily injury or death. The goals of the team are to promote public trust by conducting professional and consistent multi-jurisdictional investigations of major incidents, primarily law enforcement involved fatalities and serious injury incidents. Another goal is to maximize the availability and sharing of the latest technology, equipment and techniques, and to consolidate and share the skills of the most experienced supervisors and investigators, and to conduct thorough investigations in a timely fashion in a, in a timely fashion as is feasible under the circumstances. The team is activated when a chief of police or sheriff requests a consult from the SMART commander, who then determines based on previously established protocol whether SMART will investigate the incident. When an investigation is complete for Everett, it is forwarded to the Snohomish County prosecuting attorney for review and to determine if criminal laws were broken. Washington State Administrative Code requires an independent investigation when an incident of, uh, of an officer's use of force results in serious bodily injury or death. WAC 139.12-030 mandates that the involved agency, in our case, Everett Police Department, have no involvement in the investigation and that SMART is prohibited from sharing any information with the involved agency until the investigation is complete. The WAC also mandates a firewall to prevent information sharing with strict protocols for any breaches of the firewall. These investigations are strictly administered and audited to ensure compliance. Um, so this is important for us to note because sometimes the media knows something long before our team does. So we learn about things in the media as well. The SMART team is responsible for all communication around investigative updates, and we as a city do not receive information before it's released to the community. So I hope that helps everyone understand the process, but if you have additional info questions, I'm happy to take them and try to get uh, answers back to you on how this works when there's a use of force incident in the city. That's great, thank you, Mayor. And I had asked you to remind us how that um, process worked because I couldn't quite remember exactly how the law worked for us. So thank you, appreciate yeah. that. So if questions come to mind uh, tonight or later, just email me and, and I'll try to get back to you as timely as I can. And I don't have any further updates this evening. Thank you. Uh, Deb Williams, welcome this evening. Do we have anyone signed up to speak uh, for public comment? Good evening, President Stone Saver. Thank you. We have no community members signed up to speak this evening. We do have uh, directors from various departments on um, 
items later in your agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go on to council comments and liaison reports, starting with council member Zarlingo. Thank you. Um, well, just a brief comment. I think uh, so many of us see our responsibilities primarily as ensuring public safety, and uh, and that's a kind of a supportive effort on our part. It's foundational, but we are enablers. The people who make that happen are our first responders. I don't want to say any more other than to express my gratitude for their courage and their service. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ryan. Great. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, on Monday, I attended the Lowell Neighborhood Association meeting, and they um, uh, had a good group to, to chat a little bit more about uh, just how the neighborhood can come together for emergency preparedness. And so it was just a great showing of how neighborhoods can really band together and neighbors can band together to make sure that in the case of a, a natural disaster that uh, they know, uh, they can map out their neighborhood and know where to find resources and just work together to, uh, to be neighborly. So uh, kudos to the little neighborhood for getting that going. Uh, yesterday I attended the library board and there was a presentation from Everett Housing Authority about the Parks District development going on uh, in the works up in uh, District 1 in Councilmember Fossey's neighborhood. And they were sharing the presentation with the library board because they have, uh, they're intending to potentially pursue um, another uh, library branch up in that area. So I think that would be, they had some drawings and some renderings of what it could look like in the, the square that they're working in the, working on in the community space that they're working on, including a potential relocation of KSER up there. And it was very exciting to hear about. It was great to see the drawings, and so just really thrilled to um, see all those great ideas coming together. Uh, the meeting was also a little bittersweet because we got our uh, liaison assignments, and I'll be rolling off my assignment with the library board, and Councilmember Fossey will be taking over. So, uh, so I know you'll have a lot of fun with that. It's a great group, and their library is just doing some really amazing work to establish lifelong learners. So kudos to the library board and the library. I wanted to share uh, about the April 1st recycling event coming up. Uh, April 1st from 9 to 3 p.m. at the Everett Station. Uh, the city's putting on a recycling event to help with recycling some hard to recycle items uh, for small processing fees, things like tires, appliances, propane tanks, porcelain toilets and sinks, bulky wood, electronics, mattresses, and document shredding. So uh, it's a good opportunity to get some spring cleaning and clean out your garage with some of those hard to recycle items. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fossey. Um, I'll just be brief in my comments. Uh, I just want to send um, my uh, sincere uh, thoughts and prayers and good vibes and wishes um, sincerely from my heart from all of those impacted. Um, it, this kind of line of work uh, is is one that comes with a lot of risks and um, it does take a certain amount of bravery uh, to go into these to these roles and I just really want to sincerely thank um, everyone who steps out and does that um, for their service thank you councilmember Folkley Good evening, everybody. Um, I was at the Bayside neighborhood uh, last night. Well, I wasn't there, I was on Zoom, so thank you. And uh, one question I wanna bring back, which I should know the answer, and I'm not expecting an answer tonight, but you probably know, it goes to the Parks Department, I think. Um, the city-owned property down on West Marine View Drive in between the port and the Navy base, it's ours, it's a little park. What's going on with that? Is there a timeline? So that's a question I'm putting out right now. Uh, you can get back to me, certainly. Um, just before this meeting, I was at the Alliance for Housing Affordability and we deep dived into um, the bills 1110-5466. You don't care about numbers. Middle housing, transit-oriented density, um, ADUs and lot split bill. So it was pretty interesting and in being able to talk with other city planners and other uh, council members and mayors. Um, so that was good. Uh, Mayor, thank you for that. Um, recently in Olympia, uh, 
they've had one of two investigations completed for um, for their use of lethal force. Um, and what they did on their March 7th, the council, what council did on their March 7th meeting was um, invite the community members that are part of the investigative team um, because there's a whole slew of different people that are involved in that investigation. Anyways, they had them come and uh, bring their thoughts and ideas forward so better to possibly have more discussion amongst jurisdictions because it happens everywhere and no, you know, even though it's a state law, everybody's a little bit, it changes and there's no playbook, so to speak, kind of like for districts, but not at all like for districts. Uh, so I'm requesting that um, when this is all said and done, um, we have our community members also uh, come and give us their take um, on the scenarios. And now that we've, we're gonna have two, um, breaks my heart. Uh, I think that'll be a good idea. Um, Mm, I'm shaking. I'm sorry, you guys. It is tragic, so I'm sorry. And that is all. Thank you. Um, last Thursday, I was able to attend the Northwest Neighborhood Association meeting and um, ended up fielding questions for about an hour and a half. They had a lot of questions that they had pent up in demand to get answers to. Um, many of them had to do with the Waits Motel, as you may imagine, and then there were also uh, a lot of questions about the homelessness, um, the impact on the community, the businesses, the crime, um, you know, a lot of public safety issues. And so uh, that was unfortunate. I think um, their sense is that they're not sure that whatever we're doing is working, and so it would be nice to, um, if we can get the uh, community safety committee to talk about some of these things and come up with some ideas for things that we could do that could positively impact the neighborhoods in some way. Um, they were glad to hear about the, um, the neighborhood cleanup. I think they're going to try to get involved in that. And then the other thing that came up again with this neighborhood, it, the last time I was there, they mentioned it as well, which is really has to do with the neighborhood grant program. And so as we go through the budget committee um, process this year on our budget for next year, I'd like to review what we're doing, what the spending has been, kind of get a, a historical look at what we were doing in the past. Because um, I think they're not the only neighborhood that has mentioned that they thought, you know, we were better, more supportive in the past or they had more opportunities to get funding for projects. And then, um, and then one of the pro one of the other questions is they're wondering about the avail availability on an ongoing basis for those kind of those large project grants that we used to give, and I'm not, just not sure where we're at on that. So, if we can get that at the budget committee, that would be great. Just um, a uh, yes, just a couple of quick comments in response. Uh, absolutely, we can follow up and get that information. The on, as far as uh, Northwest neighborhoods concerns. You know, this is something we, we hear from all the neighborhoods around, you know, what's happening on our streets. And I just like to publicly say, oftentimes we talk about it as homelessness, but really the challenges that are plaguing our neighborhoods and downtown businesses are really related to addiction. Mm -hmm. I think not everybody on, on uh, people experiencing homelessness are not necessarily engaged in illegal activities, but a lot of our uh, severely addicted, fentanyl addicted folks is, is what's really causing this, um, the criminal behavior and the, and the real nuisance crimes. And so I kind of talk about it as we've got a homelessness housing issue, but we also have an addiction crisis. And, and so there's just, just making sure that helping our neighbors and understand there's, there's different populations that we're dealing with on the streets. But I think uh, Community Development Director uh, Julie Willey was planning on an update of ex Great. to the public safety community on exactly what we are doing and how that's working. Um, and then on the neighborhood grants, absolutely we can make that part of the budget process. We've heard this uh, from a couple neighborhood groups. Uh, I think uh, the, one of the big changes is we're trying to be more equitable. We have very active neighborhoods. Northwest neighborhood is one of them, and I think they have often gotten large grants. And then we have other neighborhoods that maybe don't have as 
many volunteers and is maybe not as organized, but they also need money. And so I think uh, the community engagement team has been trying to kind of equitably spread those monies mm -hmm. to, to different organizations, but it is a great di discussion for council to dig into in the budget process. So just, yeah. it's there is a method to the madness, um, but it is, we have a limited budget, and so we try to spread it around to all of the neighborhoods and community organizations yeah, that need yeah. it. But happy yeah, to report I, back. I can see where, I mean, it, it makes sense to me. I, I'll look forward to talking to you. It makes sense to have some portion of the funding just be kind of a give, like you get this no matter what you do. And yet, I don't want to, I want to make sure we're not penalizing neighborhoods that do get are organized. Active. Yeah, yeah, and are exactly. active because others aren't. So I just yeah. want to make sure that we're striking the right balance there. Makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chief Templeman, I, my, our thoughts are with you. Um, it's been a rough couple weeks with two shootings and um, all, all sorts of other things going on. So um, I hope that you're, you're, you and your crew are taking care of yourselves and thank you so much for your service to our community and everything you do for our residents, for the people who work at the city and we just really appreciate you. Uh, do we have an administrative update this evening? No update tonight. Thank you. And Mr. Hall, what does the city attorney's office have for us tonight? There is no report from the legal department and contrary to my earlier email, there is not an executive session tonight. Thank you. We will move on to our consent agenda. Do I hear a motion for the nine consent items? Council Member Ryan moves approval of the nine consent agenda items. Seconded. We have a motion and a second for the consent agenda. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. We have three proposed action items. Items 10 and 11 are second readings. They've already been into, read into the record at a previous meeting, but I will read item 12 into the record. Um, item 12 is Council Bill 2303-17. It's a first reading. Adopt an ordinance to amend and close a special improvement project entitled Rotary Park Renovation. Fund 354, Program 072 is established by ordinance number 3821-21. The third and final reading on this item will be on April 5th. Are there any questions or comments on the proposed action items? Hearing none, we'll move on to our action agenda. Item 13, adopt the resolution for the North Creek Stormwater Management Action Plan. Do I hear a motion? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't. Yes, I uh, make that motion. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the uh, stormwater management action plan. We did hear a presentation last week. Are there any questions or comments? This item. Councilmember Vokley. Just a comment. I think I probably said it last week, but wow, what a lot of work. And yay, we're getting. Um, some stormwater management and some upping of the percentage of water treated. Whoop, whoop. So uh, thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, well, I just want to thank you for all of your work and the passion that you do for this uh, work, which can seem a little wonky to some of us. Um, it comes through in the presentation. So thank you. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Item 14, Council Bill 2302-05, third and final reading. Adopt ordinance amending EMC 10.78 related to limitations on open carry of weapons at public meetings and possession of certain firearms for individuals 18 to 21 years of age, amending chapter 10.78 EMC. Do I hear a motion? Council Member Ryan moves approval of Council Bill 2302-05. Vogley seconds. Questions or comments? Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Item 15, award and authorize the purchase of two single sidewalk restrooms with Romtech Incorporated from Sourcewell number 081721 RMT COE number 2022-090 for approximately $315,000, 115, $111,000.32, including Washington State sales tax. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? Uh, I have a joke um, and 
Are you sure it's approximately with that 32 cents? Mm -hmm. I would say. <laughs> that is all. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Fossey. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions um, so thoroughly. Uh, I think the only other question I had with regards to this uh, and it's just from a lack of familiarity with um, the approach to having more open stalls versus enclosed facilities, like the pros and cons of both. And was there, because I know uh, in like the Portland Lou that they had some that were a little bit more open and not as confined. I didn't know of the pros versus cons on that or if that was even an option that was considered. Bump. Bob Leonard Parks Facilities. I think I understand your question. You're you're referring to the difference between like an open, like where multiple people can go in at once versus More, single occupancy? Uh, well, the, the enclosed single occupancy versus um, some of the ones that were a little bit more open air, transparent. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, we did look at some more of the uh, uh, options where it was a little bit more open air. I think you'll see a little bit more of those um, in like Europe and those types of aspects. Uh, but we did try to pick a style that was as open where you can see through or into it without um, having, we still wanted to make sure that uh, all of our um, users were still felt comfortable that uh, they were able to do their business in some privacy. Okay, uh, and then the only other question was, I know that we had had some history of with our pipes freezing on some of our uh, water facilities. Is that Was that given special consideration? Yeah, absolutely, uh, that still is a concern. Uh, we believe that we do have that uh, rectified, that we will be able to keep these open year round. Um, uh, we have some methods we've used in other types of outdoor restrooms like our uh, parks, uh, so we believe that'll, that'll work. Well, I just want to say, well done. I know this was a big priority for uh, a lot of the council members coming in, making sure that we had those types of facilities. So I appreciate all your work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Zarlingo. Well, I, I know facilities like this have kind of a long and varied history in, uh, in other cities as well. And I think they make, can make a real difference for our visitors and for community members. Um, and I'm hoping and assuming that we've learned a lot over the years with the different kinds of solutions. Uh, but there's a lot I don't know about this. Maybe in a year or so, or a few months after we've opened them, it might be a nice time for us to hear from you again about how well it's working. Uh, because if it works better, we can do more. I think it'll help us in a lot of ways. But I also know that it's complicated, and I look forward to learning more about how these things work in the real world with real people and, and real users. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely. Uh, and this is the first two. I do. I definitely want to make that point. Uh, council will be uh, having another opportunity. We're going to be looking to procure another restroom. It'll be slightly different than this one for one of the other locations. So it, this will be coming back, and we'd love to come back and talk about it. I know this has been a real priority for the mayor since she's come into office. So uh, we're excited to uh, make this work and uh, let everybody know how well it goes. Thank you. Thank you. And I, my only questions are, um, I mean, there's always a concern of vandalism in these restrooms, as you know, even from parks restrooms. Um, will, will there be some special patrols or how, who's going to have eyes on this? Um, yeah, we're uh, still working out all of the details on how these are going to be operated and maintained, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we have been having those ongoing discussions. And uh, this really isn't new for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have crews that operate mm -hmm. uh, right now within uh, parks and facilities. Uh, be it all over the parks, uh, plus we have transit, library, restrooms. So, you know, operating restrooms in public spaces is uh, something we feel very comfortable we'll be able to maintain. Uh, obviously, um, everybody understands that sometimes we'll encounter problems, yeah. um, but we're adept at uh, handling those problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So it'll just roll into your other program and people will be going by there. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. And we'll move on to our briefing agenda. These items come before the City Council serving as a Council Committee of the Whole and are likely to be scheduled at a future meeting. Item 16 is a resolution concerning 2023 CDBG Home AHTF Fund Allocations and Annual Action Plan. And we have, oh, hi, Julie. I thought we had Kimbra. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, Kembra is actually joining us via Zoom. Oh, that's we had right. a little Thank you. Mm -hmm. challenge Perfect. at the EMB today, and so she's, yes. she's meeting us via <laughs> Zoom. So I'm going to um, 
introduce Kembra. She's our community development manager and she oversees our funding sources that are federally funded, state funded, and locally funded. And tonight she's gonna to be talking about uh, the annual action plan and a resolution that she's bringing forward. So Kembra, are you here? <laughs> I see her. Oh, there you go. I don't. So that, okay, great. We've got our own. So, Kimbra, you just let me know when to advance the slides. Oh, there, she is. there she is. Okay. Got it. Yes, and I appreciate. Um, so, thank you, Julie, and good evening, Mayor and Council. I appreciate everyone with uh, their patience with us tonight as we navigate this. Um, but without further ado, uh, Julie, do you mind bringing up the first uh, title slide? You're good to go. Great. Okay. Um, so again, I am here to brief, uh, today to brief you all on the 2023 Community Development Funding Resolution. Um, so under our annual funding, um, the new the next few slides may be familiar as we've presented this information last year when we did 2022 fund recommendations. However, because it's been a year, uh, we're gonna go over them anyway, just so that everyone's on the same page for what we're covering today. Um, so again, since 1976, the city has received annual allocations of federal and state funds for community development projects. Funds either support either public service or non-public service projects. Service projects are typically provided by nonprofit agencies and can include activities such as rental housing support or mental health counseling. Common non-service projects are land acquisition costs, public facility or infrastructure improvements and housing rehabilitation. So in short, capital improvements. Thank you uh, for the next slide advancement. Um, so again, the city receives two federal funding allocations each year, Community Development Block Grant or CDBG funds and Home Program or Home funds. Both are regulated grant programs under HUD. CDBG funds are directly awarded to the city from HUD and we typically receive approximately $850,000. Um, CBG funds can be used to support grant administration costs, public service projects, and non-public service projects. One consi significant consideration, though, with CDBG funds is that they cannot be used for new housing creation. CDBG also has a cap constraint for public service and administration costs, meaning we can only allocate up to a certain percentage of our annual award towards these efforts. The second federal award we receive is home program funds. These funds are directly awarded to Snohomish County and the city receives, receives a set aside allocation of about 20% of that award each year. Typically we receive approximately 350,000. However, this year we were lucky that we had an increase above the average and we'll see that later in the presentation. Home funds can be used for, oh, uh, Real quick, there we go, one last bullet. Um, home funds can be used for non-service housing projects such as land acquisition or rehabilitation and new housing construction. So where CDBG funds cannot be used for new housing, home funds can. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, so then of course we also have our state funds and these are through 2060 Affordable Housing Trust Funds or AHTF funds. And those are received also through an allocation agreement with Snohomish County. Funds from this source are collected through recording fees, and typically we receive about 140,000. And AHTF funds can be used for service or operational costs to support shelters. Okay, next, next slide. So this is just a visual representation of the narrative I just went through on the previous slides, showing what is and isn't eligible for supporting activities for the funding sources. Again, CDBG can be used for a variety of eligible expenses or ex activities, but not new housing. Home can be used for non-public service activities, housing included and new housing construction. And AHTF, again, can support public services and <laughs> operational costs for emergency shelters. Next slide, please. So how much are we allocating for the 2023 program year? Um, we have our CDBG annual a, um, allocation award from HUD, and that is $859,155. We also have CDBG prior year uncommitted funds of about, of, not about, of $731,108. 
Um, real quick, what we're seeing with this is that prior funds, we want to add that to the next program year. And in this case, that's the 2023 program year. And we want to do this because we need to spend down funds and time with expenditure requirements from HUD. We have um, extra funds uh, for these program years, mainly for two reasons. Um, following a period of time where construction projects were unable to move forward due to COVID or market impact, um, many projects either had to be withdrawn or they underspent. And our community housing improvement program known as CHIP also saw a high increase of program income due to low interest rates for home loans during the pandemic. Um, CHIP provides low income homeowners with low interest loans that after a period of about 25 years um, are paid back to the city and recycled back out into the community for new loans, a revolving loan program. Um, whenever these loans payoffs are received, they offset the next year's program award, which leaves us with unused funds at the end of the program year. Hmm. Our home 2023 alloc annual allocation from Snohomish County will be $467,877. Which, as I mentioned, is a definitely an increase from our annual average. And then lastly, the HTF 2023 annual allocation from Snohomish County will be $151,510. So this gives us $2,209,650 that's available for allocations. Next slide. So how do we go about determining who gets the money from this $2.2 million? Because we are a direct recipient from HUD and CDBG is our largest funding source, it guides our funding and our public process. Our proce public process is led by community development staff and the Citizen Advisory Committee, whose recommendations then come forth to the Mayor and City Council for approval. The fall prior to a program year starting, the CAC holds a public hearing to establish priority needs. So for 2023, the priority needs hearing was established in August. And the needs were then adopted by council in September of 2022. These needs support not only the funding commitments for the year, but also a long range plan, federal funding um, spending plan that we have to submit to HUD. And that's known as the consolidated plan. I'll mention this later in the presentation as well. Following the adoption of needs by council, funding opens for application submissions. City staff and committee members review applications. And then another public hearing is held to establish funding recommendations based on the proposal submitted. And those report, proposed award recommendations are then presented to council in a resolution as we're seeing in today's briefing. Next slide. Okay, so the CDBG annual action plan is a key component of the CDBG program and it's um, submitting this plan to HUD. Uh, the annual action plan essentially tells HUD how we're going to spend our funding for the upcoming year. This is due to HUD every spring and must align with Snohomish County, County's funding calendar as well. And that's due to the home agreement, um, which, is been, which I mentioned prior. Again, the annual action plan program year uh, runs on a mid-year cycle with the program year starting on July 1st and ending June 30th of the following year. Um, and as mentioned also, uh, the city also has this long range guiding document named the consolidated plan that covers a five year period for how we expect to spend our federal funds. The current consolidated plan runs from 2020 until 2024 and the annual action plan supports one year of that document and must align with the goals as they were adopted by HUD. Next slide. So here we have our 2023 award allocation snapshot. And this is taking all the allocations that are presented in the resolution and putting them into the needs that were established. So this is a visual representation of our 2023 funding, which will support needs on housing, homelessness, public facility improvements, and additional basic services. Our largest share of the funding pie, as you'll see, will go to support the housing needs with $1,232,877, or about 59%. Our second largest share will support public facility improvements with $605,263, 31%. Homelessness will be supported by $161,510, or about 8%, and other basic services will be supported by $40,000 of CDBG funds, about 2%. Next slide. So what is the next step for this once we determine all these funding recommendations? 
We bring this back to uh, City Council for action next Wednesday, March 29th. Following that, we move forward with, if it's approved, um, to submit submission to HUD on May 15th. Uh, this is also to align with Snohomish County's annual action plan. And then on July 1st, uh, the program year begins and projects can start. And I believe that that's it. So at this time, I will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Kimber. That was a very well uh, organized presentation with a lot of good information. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Councilmember uh, Bogley. Thank you, Kimbra, and I see you online participating in this meeting. Um, where to go? The non-public service projects, city public improvements, uh, it says contingency project, capital improvements for city-owned public facilities and infrastructure within low-income census tracts. Can you just talk about that more, please? Yes, good question. Um, so HUD guides that CDBG funds must, um, when they be used for public facility improvements and public facilities, let me just pause right here, can be anything from a food bank um, to you know a bus shelter. So HUD and CDBG really has a wide definition of public facility improvements. But public facility improvements must comply with area benefit. And when we look at area benefit, we have to tie that back to low income census tracts. This HUD relies on census data to be able to track this. And so we look at the fact that there are a lot of, um, or a lot of census tracts separate. Uh, one of the, I guess, advantages to this for the city of Everett is that over 51% of Everett is qualified as low income. So we can use um, CDBG funds to really benefit the community as a whole. But we also try and allocate them specifically to census tracts. And so that may be um, 419 that's in South Everett. That may be 402 that's in you know Northwest Everett. Um, a lot of arterials in Everett have low income census tracts around them. So we look at doing improvements within those census tracts. Does that help to answer the question? I think so. So I guess contingency is just, we'll figure it out as we go. Uh, contingency <laughs> is more that this may end up being that we have, you know, for example, we have two, we have two um, other um, non or capital improvement projects, right? So we have a building improvement at the village, which will be an area wide benefit for public facility improvement. Right. Um, and we have minor home repairs housing. Well, if either one of those projects doesn't fully utilize their grant award, those are contingent, those are uncommitted funds. Contingency use can be put into public facility improvements elsewhere so that they still get utilized with a funding expenditure deadline by HUD. Thank you. You're That's welcome. All. Thank you. Any other questions? I can also remember Ryan. Great. Thanks, Kimbra. Are we at risk of uh, losing some of the funding from 2018? Does it expire or anything along those lines? Another good question. Man, you guys are full of good questions. <laughs> um, so the uh, CDBG expenditure deadline is actually seven year period. So we are still within a good range to be able to use those funds, but that is absolutely right. HUD also has um, kind of first in, first out kind of method with it. Every time we get program income, it does offset that. Program income is to be used first. Uh, but of course, utilizing the 2018 funds first to projects will be our first priority. And then subsequently 2019, 2020, and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Kimbra. We will see you back on, uh, I'm sorry, what was the date that this comes next back week. next week? We'll see you then. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Kimbra for the excellent work that she does. Clearly, she knows a lot about our federal government and uh, how we can best spend our money. And uh, it's a, every time I hear her, like, it's so hard to comprehend and, and obviously she does a great job and now I feel like I speak her language a little bit. So I appreciate your questions as well because it shows you're starting to really understand the complications of it as well. So thank you. Completely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to item 17, adopt a resolution concurring with stack recommendation and authorizing the mayor to implement the next steps for ARPA funded projects and initiatives listed in the resolution recital C. 
And so, hi, Julie. You're going to help us understand this one, too. Yeah, good evening. So um, I'm Julie Willie. I'm Community Development Director. Uh, today I'm here again with my colleagues, kind of representing uh, interdepartmental work that we're doing to bring forward our ARPA projects and initiatives. Um, this is our first quarter update, as well as um, bringing forward a, a resolution for your approval, um, with hope to bring that action forward next week. Um, you've received this information via the Council Digest, and so a lot of it will be repetitive, so I apologize for that um, if you did indeed read it, um, but you know, I think you'll enjoy it nonetheless. Um, and again, I will do my best to answer the questions, give you the updates, but if you need further information, either my colleagues can provide it for you tonight or we can get it to you um, after tonight. So with that, we'll move right on. And I think I only actually have four, oh no, I don't, I lied. I thought I only had four slides. Um, okay, so first off, let's just do an overview of where we're at. Um, you have previously authorized $13,920,286 for city staff to move forward projects and initiatives. Tonight, we're going to bring forward a request for $1.375 million, and that would be a total of $15,295,286. Um, our total ARPA award was $20,695,570,000, so funds not yet allocated um, is about $5.4 million. Uh, I'm just in, in means of an update, I'm just going to kind of go down our previous resolutions and we did a little status report. So there's either a green check because we've done it, a red check because there's some change or it's uh, completed, but most of them you'll find are in progress. Um, I won't, I'll try to go quickly on some of them because you've heard them before and we don't really have any new updates, um, but again, just you can ask questions um, if, if I don't hit the, the key points. So the, the pallet shelter purchase, that's old news. We, we did purchase 40 more pallets, um, and I'll give you a little bit more of a pallet update uh, down just a bit further. Everett Ford grant round one has been implemented and for the most part is completed, um, but there still is a lot of cleanup and catch up and things like that um, in regards to just making sure all the reports are done and the money gets spent. And as Kimbra explained, sometimes they don't spend the money like they thought they were gonna spend the money. And, and so there's a lot of um, kind of pro processes that will be, be going ongoing. Um, our pallet shelter expansion, I think as you remember, we have three pallet sites that we are working to um, establish. The first one being uh, the Everett Gospel Mission, which I gave you an update last time, is, is up and running. And, and the, the funding will be shifting from the county and the state funding to us utilizing ARPA funding. So that will be happening in the next quarter or two. So that um, is going to be a change that probably will bring a contract to you all. Um, but that is yet to, yet to be finalized. The second project is the Faith Family Village, the eight units uh, at Madison and Casino um, with Interfaith and the Faith Family Food Bank. Um, we are still awaiting formal um, final documents from the congressional appropriation dollars that we got, um, but it's really close. We, we feel like it's any day now we're gonna get that, that award and then we can move forward with site development and purchasing the pallets and working to get that project up and running. And then the third project is, is working with Volunteers of America. They have submitted, um, they've had a pre-application, a land use application process, and so we're just awaiting final land use um, application and to continue to move that project forward for 20 um, single women and their children. So. Uh, service coordination for those who are unsheltered, that is essentially our chart 2.0, our case management uh, creation we brought on our case manager last our case manager coordinator and now have an RFP out and have that is finalized and we're in the process of moving forward hopefully with a contract to bring in two full-time case managers to work alongside our case management coordinator and we're hopeful that that will start in July ish so um, now I've got to get my notes because these are ones I'm not as familiar with. Um, the ep epic green uh, bridge type study and location. Um, I need my glasses too. Um, the RFP was co 
completed, selected, and the professional service agreement is to come to you uh, soon. The digital permit accelerator, uh, that brought in a new staff person and that uh, continues to make positive impact in our permitting counter and the innovations and in technology that are being used there. So that's been a, a great um, positive movement forward for that team. Um, Bob shared with you the, uh, the public restrooms update. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll continue obviously to bring that back to you as well in these ARPA updates. So if Bob doesn't have bathroom updates, I can bring you updates when we do ARPA things because, you know, it's fun to talk about. Um, clean Everett program this year um, is, is exciting. It's year two of our Clean Everett Day. That'll be coming up in June and uh, parks and facilities are kind of leading that this year. You did. No, you, were, you were fine. Okay. I'm not sure. I, I just. No, I, I heard it. Thank it you. Was quiet. Okay, mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, C Click Fix, uh, the, the 311 app, is uh, close to being launched within probably quarter two or quarter three. So that's kind of exciting for our residents to be able to have that access. Um, the next one is the daytime uh, shelter. And we have been working with a um, our Catholic um, Catholic campus here in, in Everett and I'm um, working with some local service providers to talk about the concept of adding daytime amenities um, for those that are um, needing access to services or living unsheltered and um, neighborhood outreach is, is the next plan and, and then uh, figuring out the land use application and the management plan so there's still a lot of work to be done um, but we're really trying to move that quickly because it's definitely been a need in our community and we know that there's a lot of services that people could access if we could get them connected to it. So um, the Thornton Sullivan, um, that's kind of our first red one, I think. Um, the repurpose of the city building, um, unfortunately that building burned down. And so um, we took to vetting other uh, locations to see if it was viable to, to use those funds for a separate building. Um, the idea was that we were gonna place case managers in that, in that facility, um, but we just really realized that, that that isn't a best use of our funds right now. So we've, we've kind of taken that $500,000 and put it back into the yet to be allocated pot of, of dollars. So uh, Everett Ford round two has been, has been uh, launched and actually all of the applications are, are, have been submitted and our team is starting to process um, what's next and what's to come. And so we can certainly give you a greater um, update on that at our next um, update. Uh, and Dan's here too, if you have any specific questions about that. Uh, utility loss, we had originally um, allocate, you had originally allocated up to $1 million and due to other uh, funding sources, they only ended up needing $372,552. So the difference there again went back into that unallocated pot of dollars and um, yay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. The next one is the public safety gun buyback. You probably remember you did get an update on the success of that. And I know that a lot of um, guns were being able to be taken off of our community, out of our community and for uh, just you know $25,000. So that was a, a definitely a successful um, event. In regards to the police property room, um, a PSA with public service, no, professional service agreement um, will be coming to you for the design of, of that property room um, in the near future. So look, look forward to that. And then um, in regards to the fire training facility, you've already um, had a previous action for that and the, they're in the design phase. So uh, again, those public restrooms you already heard about, but there it is again. And then um, lastly, the urban forest uh, allocation has, has launched and we have a tree inventory going and a new tree software has been launched. So I feel like that's a lot of good work that we've been doing. Uh, moving Julie, these I think I, I might have missed it. The increased mental health support there, the third from the top. For oh, I'm sorry. You sure, I missed it. You sure didn't miss it. I Can you remind it. me what that? Yes, absolutely. I can't remember. I jumped over that one. Um, the, that is the, the addition of the mental health professionals in the library and the fire department. Mm -hmm. So it's piloting those two new embedded social worker programs to expand the uh, behavioral health support to our residents. And that um, we're currently in the process of, of interviewing 
uh, or trying to get interviews. It's a hard market out there to attract mental health professionals, as you can imagine, but um, we're hopeful. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, yes. one more thing. Absolutely, because that's a perfect timing because we're gonna move on to the future, so this is all okay. updates. Right. Councilmember Bogley. Well, you just mentioned that you thought that, that was a whole <laughs> lot of good work that you've been doing. I agree. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's all. Councilmember Fossey. I'm uh, sorry, Councilmember <laughs> Council <laughs> <Yeah>. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, curious about the repurposing of the city building, and uh, so is there a plan for where case managers will go in, in lieu of that space? Um, Yes, uh, the I like my current idea and hope is that when we are and we are able to move forward with the day center, there is um, on that campus. There's actually a small office space that's kind of adjacent to it, and so by having our case managers adjacent to the day center, then we can kind of pilot having extra um, case management available, um, and also help those case managers bring in our lead social workers, our host social workers, our navigators, or the other services and kind of create more of a um, unity of, of services versus all of us just, you know, the city providing all of the case management, like it's more of a collective effort. Great, fantastic, thank you. Oh, and uh, I guess for Dan, if, um, when will the awards be announced for the Everett Forward Round 2 grants? Hi, Dan Ernesty, Economic Development. We have until the end of the month, um, I guess technically next Friday, until we uh, winnow down the, the list. So it's coming up soon. Great. And obviously it's not just cut and dried at that point. It's where we announce that people will uh, go through another round of eligibility checks and things like that that go forward. That will, but yeah, should be soon. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Oh, I should just add, we got about $3.4 million for that $1 million of, of funds, which range pretty broadly. Appreciate that. Thanks. Thank right. Yes, let's move okay. to the future. I asked him not to leave because <laughs> lo and behold, he's, he's off onto the first um, item of our 2023 quarter one ARPA project request that you're being asked to consider in the resolution. And I'll take it away. So we've talked uh, quite a long time about a, a project for South Everett specifically and really encouraging the business community there. And it's taken many different iterations over, over the period that after ARPA was announced really. And uh, we focused in based on um, ongoing conversations with the community as well as just a desire to, to uh, see um, real growth happen there that is equitable but also um, supports the sound transit investment that's happening uh, region wide. And so we have uh, suggested two different initiatives, one that is more citywide and that's that's the second one. The first one is focused on the web triangle where we would uh, work on a plan document that would help us for the next five to seven years before construction starts on sound transit to figure what's strategic that the city can do utilizing uh, right away, utilizing our own resources specifically, which include Cash Park, which include the golf course and you know, other resources that we might uh, bring to bear, like um, the parks pros plan and, and different elements and how we can just put those in a phased program and uh, see positive change happen before construction starts. And so that's the first one, I'll stop there and then talk about the second. Just if you can remind me what web sounds stands for Oh yeah, for again. I'm sorry, yeah, speaking in acronyms. W-H-E-B, uh, Westmont Holly neighborhood, Evergreen, which includes both the neighborhood but also the street and Boeing. And, you know, basically the triangle is formed by the three light rail stations, um, one of them provisional, but the other two that are in the South Everett area, 
we don't know exactly where those are going, but it's just a unique opportunity in that area because, uh, as you know, most of the light rail has gone up highways. And this really is coming off the highway and, and can create more of a, a complete transit-oriented uh, community that uh, is supplemented not only by light rail, but um, Everett Transit and the community transit swift lines that are crisscrossing that area. So it's got a real coherence with the, uh, with the job opportunities in the Southwest Everett industrial area. Jobs, housing, um, uh, amenities mm -hmm. that are already there but are, are able to be enhanced in the future. And of course, I, I shouldn't uh, not mention Payne Field too, which we just anticipate will be growing in the future. Can I just add to that this is this is a real priority just because of the the concern around um, how do we mitigate there's so many positive impacts that light rail is going to provide this community but we also want to mitigate um, the more negative impacts of displacement and affordability how do we preserve affordability while we grow because that this community is going to grow <laughs> so we want to preserve the affordability we have both in housing and in in the businesses and 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 come up with a, a strategy that you know works in partnership with the community because it is going to grow <laughs> but it is something that we've been wanting to plan for for a long time because that is the only area of our city that has the possibility for this type of growth whereas the rest of our city is more built out so and i should add too that this won't be the only work that we're doing each of the station areas will be studied very thoroughly as we move forward, but those will be more traditional um, planning department plans. Uh, the pros plan will be updated in whatever it is, five and a half years, right? Five, five years, roughly. So that will be a significant uh, feature of this planning. And then of course, all the things going around with light rail and sound transit will, will continue to be studied. Uh, the final decision there won't be made until uh, 2026 and I believe kind of mid-year, so about three years from now. The second opportunity is uh, something I've honestly have been somewhat frustrated by the lack of information that I have about our own businesses. And this has been something that started when I, when I was at the city of Shoreline and then you know, continued on here and maybe even got worse here just because there are so many businesses and they're so diverse. Um, we have very little real inf way to engage with those who have business licenses in our city. Um, we are somewhat uh, limited in what we can collect and how we can collect the information just through the business license function itself. But we have lots of opportunities through uh, self-populating databases from the businesses themselves and if we can provide incentives for them if we can provide opportunities for them for uh, things that actually help their businesses we think that we can create a, a engagement with them that is 21st century smart and so this is uh, probably a program that I'm not smart enough to even describe at this point because I need to have, uh, you know, this, this money is helping to educate our whole system and, and put the systems in place that we can be uh, cutting edge in how we interact with those businesses. And when I say bus every business license, I'm speaking specifically of those businesses that are located in the city limits. Um, as you may or may not know, um, if a business is doing business in the city of Everett, it also needs to get a business license even if it's located outside the city. So we're talking specifically about the, the many businesses here. I, I also just really want to encourage the smaller businesses, the home-based businesses, and provide a way to help them view the business license process as something more than just a fee that they have to pay and kind of a, an annoyance. I want them to really feel, and uh, you know, I know this is probably, uh, I don't know if anyone will ever think, it, think of it this way, but kind of like 
I'm a, I have a membership card in a club that I'm really proud to be a, a part of, and that's a Everett's, Everett local, local business. And uh, there's some real interaction, there's some real exchange, there's some connectivity between and really forming in industry clusters, but as well as affinity groups that we just can't identify right now. If you were to ask me, Dan, where are the women-owned businesses? It's a really hard question for me to answer unless they've self-identified through some Google searchable or whatever method. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I would like to be able to have much more, uh, much more information and, and provide much more support for. So that's the part of that 500,000. So those two things we haven't, you know, I've roughly said 200 and 300, but I, I wouldn't be too solid on that. I'm just um, thinking both of those together are those small business um, initiatives that, that will be continue to be fleshed out. The next touch that you will have as a council will probably be approving the RFPs that go out to uh, attract um, the contractors that will help provide the services. Yes, sir. Uh, does, can this, should this relate to the upcoming consideration we're doing of the Economic Alliance, Snohomish County, and Everett Chamber of Commerce activation? I mean, is there an integration yeah, opportunity question. here? I mean, I can, I can see or hope for an environment where all these, where all these businesses are seeing that they see something, some benefit to them by being better integrated or better connected so they know all the opportunities that are out there. Right. I, I definitely think it will be an opportunity f to help us engage with businesses and get them connected in, in all sorts of different ways. The Economic Alliance uh, efforts would be one of them. I don't see these as duplicative, but rather really complementary. Um, and, you know, oftentimes it seems like the same group of businesses are hearing about the same programs. And it's, it's just a allow us to sink our roots a little bit deeper into into the into the very rich soil that we have here in, in our Everett economy. Yeah, because my sense sometimes is especially the small businesses are so busy just doing right. the normal blocking and tackling of keeping the doors open and business flowing that they don't necessarily connect automatically or don't know about some of those opportunities sometimes until it's too late. Thank you for the football metaphor as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mayor. Yeah, I just want to comment, you know, this part, of, you know, when we're bringing these Arbor project requests forward, some of them are further developed and some of them are less further developed. And really what we're asking for from all of you is your approval that this seems like a good idea, <laughs> that we can go further into this area. And then when, as uh, Dan Ernesty shared, when we have a you know a consulting contract for somebody to assist us with this, that comes back through, and then we'll that's this, an ARPA funded thing. These are things that we we don't have the money to do, and that we're trying to you know do these things for our community, um, but we we don't want to waste staff time and really fleshing out a full plan until you tell us that this is going to be a, a, a good use of ARPA funds, because otherwise we can't afford to do it. So just a reminder, kind of, some, some of the things are more tangible, like buying a restroom, and some of them are like, we really want to do this, but we still have to figure out how, so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Councilmember Ryan. Thanks. Um, for the uh, Equitable Business Strategy and Everett Business Support Network, network portion of it, uh, when businesses fill out an application, or a business license application, what are some, is that an, electronic application that they fill out it and is. Then there are certain data fields that they enter? Mm -hmm. It is. Are, and are, go ahead. I, it's a state process that we piggyback on. Mm -hmm. Are there data fields that they complete for women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses? There and, are not. So for, so it would essentially be going to track down all business people that have a business license in the city of Everett to ask for those affinity groups and designations. So it sounds like a lot of work to go back to, like maybe the state needs to have those data fields so that we can run a query to pull those types of things. That would be helpful. That would be <laughs> fabulous. I would strongly support that. I, um, I don't think it's, I mean, you mentioned tracking down. Um, well, let me say two things. One is, there are privacy issues, and I think the state 
is going for basically the the least amount of information that they feel like they're comfortable handling. Um, and uh, there is a field for type of business, for example, the ESCI, the industry classification, but that's um, optional. And so even some of those things are, are fairly loose. Um, on, the, on the flip side, though, given social media, given some of the different ways that we have now, um, of providing some kind of benefit for the business owner or the business if, if they sign up for a, a, a profile, they create a profile. And in creating that profile, the, a lot of those questions would be asked. There's also surveys that, that we can uh, do that also have that process of creating profiles. I don't know if this is legal, but I've thought too about providing a discount Please for. Also <laughs> <laughs> Not like that kind of illegal. It's more like that kind of illegal. Uh, but uh, providing a discount for business license fees for those, uh, or a credit for those who have a profile. Um, so that might be a financial benefit that they have. Um, it, might have certain events that are open or have different pricing for um, for profile members or not. So it's just kind of all these things probably sound familiar because you're probably members of lots of these different things that you've created profiles for that you've provided voluntarily a lot of information to whoever is asking for it. And, and that would be the same kind of thing. Great. About how many businesses would you say are in the city of Everett? About 6,000, I believe. Uh, so um, I do constituent database work for my other job. Um, and so creating a complete database and a complete set of data, it sounds like it's a pretty, st it, I'm worried about who's going to get left out. Like who aren't we reaching to include in the, in a database? Who's not getting, who's not able to, to do it or they don't have the time or how would, how would we equitably reach 6,000 business owners in the city of Everett to let them know about an opportunity like this? That is a great question, and thank goodness there might be some ARPA funds to help us figure out the best way. I would think, you know, you could do a direct mail. You could use the emails that are provided from the business license, which are getting better. They used to be really horrible. You've had about one email for every 50 businesses but now it's probably much, much more robust. Um, and, you know, there's lots, and like I say, social media, um, business associations, different ways. Um, we have utility billings. You can do reminders in the utility building, billings, you know, send, those are more like direct mails, but they're kind of piggybacks on ones that we're already sending out. Um, can start doing business newsletters, which we don't do now. Um, I think I've mentioned social media, but is that, I, I, I don't know quite how to answer your question. How can we be sure we've reached everyone? I mean, um, and I don't know how we would ever be able to answer that question, but we can certainly use every best option that we, we can think of. Sure. Yeah, and I wouldn't, you know, expect a hundred percent participation or yeah, I, reached either. So. I mean, imagine we had 20% participation, that would be over a thousand businesses. Mm -hmm. And so that would just be that much more robust. Okay. And then to uh, kind of piggyback on the comments from Councilmember Zarlingo, um, if we were to move ahead with the Everett Chamber uh, proposal, to me a function of an Everett Chamber or any Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. is to put together a directory of businesses in the community, whether or not I assume they would have to be a member and that's how they would be included. So my concern would be that we're, uh, would be working on a process that's gonna happen anyways, or uh, it just seems duplicative mm -hmm. and how efforts could be combined. Yeah, that's a great concern. And I'll keep that in mind definitely. And as we, as we work with the Economic Alliance to figure out, uh, make sure that we, we don't duplicate efforts because there's, there's plenty of work. There's no reason for two of us to be doing the same job. Absolutely. 
Thank you. Councilmember Folkley. So I thought that my questions had been asked by you two, and then they almost were completely, but so EASC wants council to um, help them out with like $300,000. And I think you kind of hit on what I'm about to say. Um, and you want two things, uh, and one of them could be about $300,000, and the EASC could probably do the work, and then it wouldn't be on, I don't know, this money could be used that way, if because we haven't decided yet, uh, and I don't think it's tonight, if we're going to um, allow the, the lease break deal <laughs> with the Economic Alliance of Snohomish County. Um, so I'm wondering if this might, could be a part of that. And then the money's already allotted. I don't know where the 300,000 would go unless it was from the unallocated funds. Uh, so that is an idea, because it's a fantastic idea. We totally need that information. But and that they might even already have like, so something. Um, I will answer that statement, and it was more of a, which was yeah, really statement. more of a statement. <laughs> yes. This way, um, one of the things is you know I'll just kind of do a slight tangent and just say, as you remember last week, there was a presentation by Economic Alliance asking for some money. It was not for this. It was for literally like rent that they wanted to have. Um, we would love just some indication whether or not to continue to work with them to bring form forward a formal proposal. We obviously have been working with them. I still don't think there's a really like tight package for you to consider, but I think we can work with them fairly quickly and get that together. If that is the, the council direction, I think it's the staff are, are you know, waiting to hear that and will re be re very responsive to that. So. That's it's on thing. the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> As for the other, I think definitely Economic Alliance would probably be interested in responding to any kind of like RFQ uh, process, and they might be the contractor to do that. I don't know. They might just be the people. They're pretty hungry, and I bet they're listening. So, Gary? Um, I, <laughs> right. Okay. And then also for the Web Triangle, I love that name, but since there were some questions. It could be WIA, and then it's Westmont Holly Evergreen Aerospace. That's all. <laughs> well, I, I guess I will say for my questions, I echo a little bit the concern about overlap with what the um, chamber is doing. And when I think about the city's economic development efforts, um, it strikes me that maybe it's not our best use of your time. You're like one person to be tracking down people who own a business license but, you know, aren't maybe not even running a business. You don't even know. You know, that there could be a lot of dead ends there. And so I guess from my perspective, uh, in, with our small department, I think that we should be probably focusing on those businesses that actually do generate revenue for the city because that's what we uh, pay you to help us do. And I view a Chamber of Commerce as someone who would be more sort of reaching out to businesses and helping them understand how they can grow and, and kind of do their thing. When they get ready to grow, then they come talk to you and you help them find a location to do that and the resources that they need to do that. So I'm a little fuzzy on what this is about. I'm not really happy and not really excited about putting a half million dollars out there for something that I kind of don't really understand what that gets us from a city perspective, even though I recognize that this might be an effort that is important for some businesses that may or may not be, you know, functioning at their highest potential. I own a business and I use the file local system and I do business in almost every city that is on that system. So I know exactly how that um, process works. And I know there is some customization you can do because other cities get d other different information from me. Um, because they've requested it specifically. So I, like for the city of Seattle and the city of Tacoma, they know that I'm a woman-owned business and so they're gathering that information. So it'd be maybe important for you to 
find out what's going on with file local and what kind of customization can we do when people sign up. I'm not sure once you're in there, it'd probably be hard, you know, for you to ask people again, but I am assuming that you have those email addresses there. For the other part of this, am I to understand that it was more of a sort of a land use um, survey to see what would be possible with the, what, what are we doing on the land use options for more, the park? More the uh, real estate development. Mm -hmm. Land use, I, I would think, is more in the planning department with uh, zoning regulations. Okay, this so be more, more like what's strategic. What's it? We are a landowner. Yeah. Uh, there and starting to ask the question: Should we redevelop the golf course? Mm -hmm. Is one of the big questions. Um, that's that's a really, you know, big elephant in the room. Yeah. Um, in a sense, and so, uh, you know, that's a really different question than you know, should we zone it to to something specific? Um, the thought was that the best route to redevelopment of that is the city to play master developer, um, and because that way that we can control exactly what what we get out of it not that we do all the construction mm -hmm. but that we get to the point where we are really defining where the parks go where the walking trails go how the um, sensitive areas are treated who the parks are really geared toward how, who the housing's geared for all these questions are really things that if we just sold without any um, plan or thought to them, they could become, uh, uh, I think we could, we may be happy with the result, we may not be, mm -hmm. and, and that would be a, a process. On, but before even that, I mean, that's really looking at the long distance view. Before that, what's possible? You know, what's even, what infrastructure is needed? What? Dan, can I, there? Yeah, yeah, can I jump in here a, a, a little bit? So first, I, I think our apologies for not our apologies for not separating these two because they're yeah, very two I different initiatives, and they should have been in two different buckets. So that's just gonna our ask mistake. If you would do that when you come and back. we'll definitely do that for when we bring it back. But the to to your point, Council President, we we do have such a small economic development team, mm -hmm. and this is an area of of unique opportunity. We don't get these very often. You know, when you think about what we can do to impact the future of our city. We, we don't have a lot because we're not landowners in very much of the city. People are always like, well, why don't you do this downtown? It's like, well, I don't own any of those buildings. <laughs> I actually don't get it. I don't get to call the shots. <laughs> we can do zoning and that's pretty much it, right? Mm -hmm. And so this, we actually have an opportunity and we know that there's this massive investment and it's such an important part of our city because it's so diverse and it, and it holds a lot of affordable housing, though not permanent, affordable housing and it's also our business center so there's just so much going on there and if we don't get ahead of the curve and not only you know of course york and the planning team we're working on the planning part mm -hmm. but on on the economic development side and and what we as landowners can possibly do mm -hmm. and that how important it is that we do that in partnership with the community which we've heard over and over again and so i'm worried about this part of our city if we don't put some money into consulting to help Dan. Yeah, no, and I so that's that, that that it's kind of this that's yeah. that's it's that part yeah. of this one I feel like I understand a little bit better what that is and I and as someone who well I guess Lori's also been through this a couple of times as someone who's talked about developing that golf course and had all the golfers in this chamber with their pitchforks um, I think there's a step that happens before we get to this part <laughs> or maybe in conjunction with it so the part about involving the community is really important because there are a lot of people that are very much uh, married to that golf course being there for them in the south end so i think we have some work to do there so anyway i don't want to spend a lot of more time on it. i'm just saying that i i think if you could split these out for me it might be better might help me a little bit understand where we are and i am I'm supportive of the development potential of the South End property. I'm not sure about this equitable business strategy piece. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's the role of government of the city government to do. So, uh, Councilmember Serlingo. Well, uh, I second uh, Mayor Franklin's 
idea about breaking these things apart. I think it'll help us a little bit. And partly because it seems like what we're trying to do for the smaller businesses is so coherent with the kind of combination or mix of economic alliance, Snohomish County and Chamber of Commerce, especially because a lot of those businesses will certainly be doing business in Everett, even if they're not um, physically located here, though many will be. And I wonder if maybe this is um, to clarify what Economic Alliance Snohomish County was proposing, if, if there's a way to um, ask if they'd interest, be interested or be the appropriate entity to spearhead some of this contact. Because, you know, there may be some sort of incentive, uh, even in terms of just connection to resources that we can offer a lot of the small businesses, they may be really well suited to do that. And maybe that's a, um, I don't know, not exactly a quid pro quo, but something we can ask them if that's if that's in their wheelhouse more, which would allow you, a small development team, to focus more on, uh, on, the, other, on the triangle. I'll just make the comment that obviously this is exactly what I, I anticipate the council should be doing, is providing real policy, kind of big picture uh, guidance, and we definitely will break it out for next week. I think our staff will also be talking um, amongst ourselves whether and even, even to include it in next week's um, resolution and you'll know before Wednesday. Um, but yeah, that, that might be excellent advice to just uh, not push it off on economic alliance, but maybe include that more in the public. Remember, we put this together way before economic alliance mm -hmm. um, was even a twinkle in your eye. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Not to Paula. belabor the point, but um, I think if we were to move forward with a chamber and one of their stated goals is to to build up their membership back to what it had been before of the 700 members and it seems like a project like this would be an amazing uh, gateway for them to to work towards that goal and then even maybe expand further than that so that's my belaboring thank you okay thanks Dan thanks <coughs> Um, so the number, the second, uh, project that we would like to request, and I apologize for my spelling error. It's not APRA, it's ARPA. <laughs> and obviously Microsoft oh, hasn't found man. that yet on a spell check, but one of our audience members did. So I thank you for bringing it. that to our attention. So the second, um, activity is, uh, do, uh, re repeating the successful gun buyback um, event that was held, and we're asking for $50,000 to be used for those uh, gift cards uh, for direct uh, reimbursement. Um, so, any questions on that? Was it $25,000 before? It so was. was this, okay, just yep. checking. Yeah. yeah. And did we just blow the money out of the water? Yeah. On the first yes. one. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And again, this money is for the gift cards. It's not for marketing. It's not for staff time. It's it's mm -hmm. direct uh, allocations to to do that program. Mm -hmm. And why do we do gift cards instead of cash? Sorry, sorry, Dan said he did. <laughs> Chief Templeman, <laughs> just curious. Yeah. Good evening, Dan Templeman, Police Department. Um, because I don't know the, the rhyme acronym that we would come up with for cash. But uh, no, this is, you know, really what this is, is this is not reinventing the wheel. I think when you, when we um, are using cash, there's different set of rules sometimes that apply to those. This is a, a format that has already been in place in other jurisdictions through um, our accounting team and our finance team. Mm -hmm. And so we're com comfortable with it and confident. And it seems to be <coughs> highly... Um, successful, and I think that the variety of the gift cards um, is something that attracts people as well. Okay, good. All right, thank, thank you. you. But if you can come up with a snazzy. Um... <laughs> Quick question uh, for Chief Templeman. Uh, sorry, um, would you uh, please remind us about the the demand that happened with, at the first event? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, we did run a very successful event last year uh, at the end of uh, December. It was just before the holidays. And um, we, that one again was $25,000. We uh, took in 200 and just over 240 firearms, unwanted firearms from people who did not want them any longer. So it's all voluntary. And, um, and we did that in about two and a half hours out of the four hour um, time slot that we had. And we had many, many uh, other firearm owners that were in line that some of them still just turned in their firearms anyway, even without a gift card, but others 
chose not to. So it was very successful for us. And our organizers of the event um, believed that um, fifty thousand dollars would be an appropriate amount based on the level of interest mm -hmm. at that time, and that we've had since. Great. Thanks. Um, as the mayor shared earlier, m many of these are not. Some of these projects are bring, being brought forward with the idea of how to bring them to fruition. And this next one is council recovery grant allocations. And this is an opportunity for our council members to who have been hearing from your constituents about the challenges that they're facing during ARPA and to develop a more of a grant COVID. Sorry, what <laughs> I'm tired too. Um, <laughs> the um, giving you the opportunity to, to allocate grants uh, for recovery efforts for, from COVID. So we've um, shared with you kind of some of the criteria because there's certainly a lot of requirements that come with ARPA funding. Um, we're throwing out an idea of 75,000 per council member. Um, there's opportunities for us to talk further about that. There's opportunity for council members to work together to pool larger amounts of money. There may be opportunities for multiple projects, um, but we really definitely want to work alongside of you so that we don't duplicate efforts, so that we don't overburden staff, and that certainly we are clear with our community what may be eligible and what might not be eligible. And Lori might have a few well, things to add. I, I'll just add that our team stands ready, primarily Julie and Susie, who have vetted a lot of the criteria, and I would encourage you to reach out often and soon as you're, as you're generating ideas, and they'll brainstorm with you. and. Um, and both Susie and Julie are fantastic at getting to yes. We just we just want to work with you early so that we don't have a miss on the federal requirements, which can be uh, challenging. And well, and I would go so far to say is we even want some kind of formal like form or some kind of process that you can maybe vet through some of the questions that will need to be answered. And and so we're not ready necess. I mean, of course, it's your decision. But I would say like we need some time to create the process so that we work really well together. And, and the goal of this was that, you know, we have district representation for the first time and we wanted to use the ARPA funding as an opportunity. I know that uh, county council also gave their council members directly money to allocate in their districts. And so wanted you all to have that opportunity, but we also have the two at large. And so again, you can either work together or the at large can think about uh, projects that might benefit the entirety of Everett. So, yeah, districts were in mind with this so that we could put more money into your communities. Great, thank you. And then our last request is simply support for the next three and a half years as we have 20 some million dollars of ARPA funds. We have been, um, staff teams have been embracing additional amounts of work and now as we're getting more into the implementation phase and the contract phase and the reporting phase and the compliance phase, um, having additional administrative support to provide that will be extremely helpful and I know my staff in particular would be so grateful. <laughs> And that is the end of, of our, um, our asks for this resolution. Um, so I'm going to click. And so, Julie, is that staff support going to be um, like on a contract basis or is it temporary you know, somebody, position? Yeah. yeah Many like, of our ARPA positions have been they're temporary because okay. they're short term funding. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Well, that was my question about whether a contractor FT, but um, with my day job and the work that we do with ARPA and um, just how much um, administrative work goes into the management of ARPA, I mean, it's federal dollars, so there's all of the federal requirements and burden that comes with that. Um, so I'm definitely supportive of a staff position and frankly surprised it hasn't come forward yet. So mm, glad to see you. it here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Too. And then we just... Um, we wanted to also just bring forward kind of the a few other projects that I believe you've all heard of before that they're still under consideration um, as, as we move forward we want you to know that we haven't forgot about them yet and we want uh, we're, we have some staff doing some work some of them are, are hot some of them are cool but but nonetheless they still are, are on our list of things that we're vetting and, and certainly as you all um, enter into your committee work this year some of these may end up being part of that. Um, the first one is the home ownership investment and wealth building opportunity. Um, we, Jennifer Gregerson, who now is uh, serving as our kind of home, our housing program manager, is kind of 
diving into that work a little bit uh, more deeply for us, and so that um, is something that can be brought forward. Uh, the downtown ground vacancy grants, and again, we can bring Dan back. Well, I guess we're not going to do that tonight. We're just kind of doing a quick overview of, of, of the projects, but let me Mayor just, Franklin. Yeah, let me just speak to this. This was something I think Council Member Tui actually um, suggested in one of our one-on-one -on -one check ins and and I think it was there. I could be wrong, but I know I do know Council Member Tui mentioned it. It could be another another one of you as well, so I apologize if I'm forgetting who. And so this was we have all these buildings downtown that remain empty <laughs> and we want to activate those spaces, but sometimes that's cost prohibitive for certain businesses. One of them, for example, is the Economic Alliance who came and says, we need help with rent. There's a vacancy, they, that, that, that has been, uh, the, the Scott Dolls have been trying to fill for quite some time and it has remained vacant. And so it'd be great to be, you know, get an organization in there that would activate that space and bring people downtown and bring foot traffic. But that's not the only space. There's multitude of properties and some of them need a lot of work to get people in there and some of them just need a little rent help and some of them need all things in between and so that's just a placeholder it would be like an Everett Forward grant round but on a much larger scale whereas the Everett Forward grants are like twenty thousand dollars or something like that these would be bigger grants so it'd be a very small number so I want to be very clear that that 1.25 million is like a handful of grant probably and and so it would be like getting three or four or five spaces activated, fantastic. But it would be up to, uh, you know, the team and then ultimately council's approval to, you know, make sure that that's the right amount for that. Councilmember Fossey. So I uh, definitely see the value of um, making sure that we have ground floor um, businesses and attractions. And I know a lot of things have been, um, vacant and neighbors have won those filled with these grants essentially what would be happening is these monies would be going to potentially developing and improving these buildings not necessarily some okay. of them could like so like i'll use one as an example i know that we have wanted to see a restaurant in the Marriott for some time, right? If we were to try to give them money to build a restaurant, there's not enough money in 1.25 million. So the types of improvements could be small, but if you think of some of the properties that are owned by another property owner downtown that need a lot of work, you know, $100,000 could get them pretty far in, in getting it up to code to move somebody in and activate that space. And so some of it could be that, some of it could be offsetting rent. Okay. So it's kind of like an incentive, like the businesses that are looking like, oh, I want to move downtown, but oh, rent's too high, or oh, that building needs too much work, or oh, um, but I don't want to, you know, mistakenly give you the idea that this is going to allow us to bring a restaurant into a space that's not built for a restaurant because there's just no way. No, no, my, my yeah. concern was more about uh, using this money towards um, people that are owning property and improving their properties for them and no. that being the end result of this that that's what more of my question yeah. was no no but that's that not sense. thank yeah. you um certainly affordable quality child care is is high on on i think many of your priority list and that certainly hasn't left left our our priorities and then the and sorry that's i'm going to keep jumping in that's been on hold just because the snowmish county has been leading the charge on this one and so i we kind of said the county's doing great work let's wait and see how theirs goes and if we need to bring it to you to do more, we'll definitely bring it back or one of your committees might just take the charge. And I just have a comment that's really sad. Uh, early Connections Child Care over on Holly uh, is closed or closing, yeah. So that's some quality child care that we now no longer have. Yeah. And then the final project that remains under consideration is stormwater infrastructure and stormwater park. Um, so. Which are really cool. And uh, with that, that's um, we, we would like to continue developing projects that are under consideration. We will be back on March 29th. I'm asking you to adopt that resolution, um, concurring with the recommendations of staff. I know that we have a little bit of follow-up to do with that one item, and so we'll certainly get back to you on that probably by Monday-ish. And then um, 
just a little other reminder that we still do have, uh, we're waiting for some contracts still from Stomish County regarding our pallet expansion, regarding the downtown restroom um, and the downtown security. And so those two will be coming to you at some point, we hope soon. Hi. Uh, to back up just a moment, the idea about the stormwater and stormwater parks, I guess the idea there is that we have these stormwater treatment facilities, but they're often just a fenced off facility that does that. And the idea is that some of them might become parks or mini parks or something like that to combine a function and, and be a benefit to a neighborhood. I believe that is exactly what, what the idea is. And I also believe that there may be some other funding sources that we are looking into um, as well. Okay, thanks. And that's the end of my... I, oh. I just have a point of clarification. So with the equitable business strategies, the one that there seemed to be feedback in, and some hesitancy, does council prefer that we break it out? And so <coughs> next week when you're looking at the resolution, by, at that point you can determine whether you're comfortable moving forward or is, is there enough hesitancy that we should not include that 300,000? Um, was, is it? Was the other one was 300. Oh, okay. I thought the, it was the, the reverse. The stuff was 300. The, the business, small business thing was 200. Is that right? Yeah. It's actually broke out it, in it the is, resolution currently. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is in the resolution a little bit differently, yeah. but I'm, I'm just looking for some minutes because then we can revise that resolution appropriately. And I think we could do it either way where council could think about it and we'll continue to include it or we can omit it. My th thought, mm -hmm. one of seven, uh, is definitely separate it and definitely talk to Mr. Clark over at the EASC. And so come back next week at least after that conversation has occurred. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I, I'm not sure. Sh uh, please do separate it because I'm not sure that I am on board with that. I'd like to see what the chamber would be able to do with that. We still have a money that's unallocated, so we could wait and see sure. how that chamber process unfolds. and. We could actually just move that port to the under consideration projects mm -hmm. and it may Work flourish and it may, yeah, yeah so we can do I'm that. A, I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's great. It doesn't prohibit us from coming back a month yeah. later or two weeks later if we decide. Yeah. And for the um, Economic Alliance, yes. were we looking for some clarity um, tonight or perhaps <laughs> next week? What we could do is bring a separate resolution back very quickly. Uh, once council provides some direction on uh, the Economic Alliance ask of 300,000. I mean, I, yeah, I, from that standpoint, I would love to hear what Gary Clark would have to say about Economic Alliance, Snohomish County's role and potential expanded chamber in that, what he thinks about some of the noodlings that we've gone through here tonight. Yeah, and we got some more, uh, Dan Ernest, you sent us some, some more information, appreciate that. Um, and so, I, I mean, from my perspective, I, I'm kind of reluctant to fund the entire amount. Obviously, the 50000 for the chamber seems good. Um, I found it interesting that Snohomish County wrote a letter of support for us to spend our money on that for them. So um, I would like to say, for me, I'd like to see us think about maybe giving them 100000 and having them find some partners in the at the county or somewhere else. I would, and again, 50 of the chamber and you know, 50 for their um, rent. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about whether they are going to have a, you know, have to suffer some kind of financial loss because of their rent breaking their lease. If they find a sublease lessee, then they're not going to need it. And it was very muddy about how that was going to play out for us. So if each of you, I th thank you for that feedback. If each of you could um, provide me any questions, I, I will follow up with Gary next week and um, early next week, and Dan and I both will, mm -hmm. and um, we'll talk about everything that was discussed tonight. But also, you know, I, I'm hearing a, a, an amount from you. I don't know if your colleagues all share, but if, if you all have kind of some my thoughts or ideas, then we can flesh that out with Gary and make sure that you know, because I don't know what is necessary for them to even be able to move downtown. Mm -hmm. That they probably might need more than that, but I don't know if there's a threshold below 300 that would work. So I'll I'll ask him yeah. all those questions. And I'd be happy to know if that is. You know, I'm just it. They, for, it's great to have them downtown. It's a private building. It's not a lot of people downtown that they're bringing. They don't have a huge workforce. And and while I think it's a good you know thing to spur people thinking about coming downtown, I'm not, our role to me is a little bit uncertain. I think 
just have just because we have money, um, and so does the Snohomish County. Thank you, Councilmember yeah, Ryan. I, I'll add to that too. I think that um, helping out with the um, establishing an Everett Chamber seems like a, a function that our ARPA dollars could cover. But if their move would benefit all of Snohomish County, then I think that the county should be helping out with that portion as well. And additionally, while I have the mic, um, I, I have hesitancy to help with covering rent when I know that there's 6,000 businesses in the city of Everett that potentially also would like to move to better their businesses. So to, um, to not help, just to not have it be more of an open process to help other businesses with potential moves for to better their businesses as well seems um, uh, that's a hard uh, that's a hard ask I think thanks and does that give you some feedback okay I'm Any sure, other just questions? more discussion I, I would uh, suspect with council as opposed to anything moving forward yet sounds good and any other questions or comments that brings us to the end of our agenda with no executive session we will now adjourn